This is Canada's Cast and Blast podcast, dedicated to anglers and hunters. For amazing tips and demonstrations that you've heard about right on this podcast, visit castandblastcanada.com. And now let's join the boys deep, deep in the woods, lakeside. We'll find Roger Tumanieri and Brian Glassy. Hello and welcome back to Canada's Cast and Blast podcast. I feel like it's been a little while since I've seen you, Bri. I think you've been up to some big things. I've been following you on social media. We've been putting some posts up on our Instagram page at Cast and Blast Canada. Want to uh, welcome back all of our listeners and uh, welcome to our host, Brian Glassy. How are you doing, Bri? I'm doing great, Raj. Crazy to think that it's already our fifth episode. That's nuts. Uh, And you're right. I've been up to an awful lot uh, lately. It's been uh, three or four different fishing openers that I've been out for, and I've got a very indulgent wife. So I've managed to get out quite a bit. I was going to say, how do you swing it? (laughs) I, I, all of my other spare time when I'm not fishing and hunting is dedicated to doing the honeydew list and doing whatever else. Okay. Okay. Give and take. (laughs) because <laughs> I, I i and i'm serious when i say this i've been living vicariously through you um you were out in the quarthas not too long ago for the musky opener and i think most recently you've been catching more big fish man tell me about your most recent trip yeah i mean before we dive into that we should probably uh give a big shout out and a thank you to our two sponsors the ammosource.com Uh, Canada's best source for ammunition, guns, fishing, everything to do with these two categories. Check out theammosource.com. Right on. Uh, We also have another wonderful sponsor in Lucky Bug Lures. Bri, tell us a bit about Lucky Bug Lures. Lucky Bug, again, as I keep telling you, is a great Canadian company, family run, family owned uh, they're employing number of people in the Vancouver area. They do some amazing, unique lures, great lures for pike and bass and walleye and especially trout. So the next time you're headed out to do some fishing, check out Lucky Bug Lures. I've also posted a few videos of some Lucky Bug Lures on our YouTube channel, and I will continue to do that to show you how the lures run and what they look like because they look amazing in the water. Awesome. And when you're catching these fish and you get a picture, you want to look amazing too. So another shout out to apparel company. Um, Word on the street is they're going to be launching a new series of hats. So stay tuned to apparelco.ca. Beautiful. So to answer your question that you just asked me, uh, I've got kind of three adventures to tell you about. The first one, the last podcast, we had discussed the musky opener. Yep. Um, this musky opener was another reminder to me that what's important is enjoying the process rather than looking for a payoff. Uh, I fished two full days hard and caught exactly zero musky. So it was a little bit frustrating. My musky partner did manage to boat three fish, but we started in a small Kawartha's Lake where we normally hit on the opener fished it from seven in the morning until one o'clock in the afternoon and didn't even see a fish, Uh, you know, and this is a lake that normally on the opener produces eight to 10 musky in a morning, no problem. So we weren't really sure what was going on. The only thing that we could think of that was different was this year, the water levels are a little bit down and there's no current running through this lake. And normally there is. So maybe that's what it was, or maybe the musky just didn't like what we were doing, but Um, Still a great weekend. We picked up at one o'clock, moved to another small lake. Um, Like I said, my musky partner boated three musky within 20 minutes. Bang, 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 one after another. Wow. And then then they were done. Um, So all of his fish came on a jointed believer in a what I would call a bumblebee pattern, yellow body with black stripes. Uh, We were trolling and uh, all of the fish came on a speed of about three and a half miles per hour so faster much faster than you would be trolling for most other species muskies are usually you know three and a half to five miles an hour depending on what the water temperature is like on that sunday we tried stony lake one of the bigger lakes and again didn't even see a fish so 
The only other thing that might be going on is uh, while we were fishing, we saw quite a few other boats. We ended up talking to some other guys and they told us that uh, there was a Facebook group that had started the previous year and doing it again this year, a tournament, a musky tournament on the opener. So there was about 75 boats entered into the tournament all across the core of the lake. So that could have something to do with it. Although we didn't really see very many boats on the first lake we were on. So I think it was something else. But there are videos of all three of those fish posted on the YouTube channel. So check those out. Um, my muskie partner, Grant, is uh, he's taught me a ton about muskie. He's not exactly the most excited in any of these pictures, mostly because the fish aren't that big, but that's okay. They were musky. I was excited. Yeah. <laughs> Those are big fish for your average angler. Um, yeah. So like you say, they're up on uh, our YouTube page and our website at castandblast.com. So check out those pictures of Grant hauling in what I, I would say are huge fish. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that was fun. We had a ton of fun absolutely on the musky opener and like i said irrespective of whether or not i put a musky in the boat it's still enjoyable to get out with a good friend it's still great after being locked down for so long to actually be out on the water and enjoying yeah. some time outdoors oh yeah it really was a nice mental break um and i'm feeling much better mentally and emotionally over the last few weeks being able to be back out it's amazing. Yeah, I've been writing a lot about mental health awareness in the magazines that I publish, uh, but not once have I considered the benefit of fishing. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's important for people to realize like just getting out into nature, whether it's fishing or just hiking, um, it's, it's so beneficial. Yeah. And again, like we keep saying, if you're not enjoying the process, don't do it, right? You need to enjoy the actual process and catching some fish is a bonus. Luckily yeah. for me, other than the muskie, I've been having a great season. So uh, the next one we need to talk about is the French River trip. I do a spring French River trip every year to, with a bunch of buddies. We go up and go in through um, the Doquise uh, Indian Reserve. And yeah. we've got a lodge there that we go to called the Tilted Took. Shout out to Terry at the Tilted Took. It's an nice. awesome lodge if you're ever looking for a place to go. Uh, self-contained cabins and we have a great time this year we timed it perfectly and the fishing was really good so um, I managed to catch the biggest pike of the week and we, nice. all throw, we all throw in 10 bucks each for the biggest pike and the biggest walleye uh, that pike wasn't all that big but it was about 26 inches uh, pictures and reports wow. on the Facebook page and I managed to catch a limit of walleye every day my big walleye was 26 and a half inches, which was about five to five and a half pounds. So decent fish. Uh, and I thought I had the big walleye in the bag too, until uh, my buddy Brent ended up catching a 28 inch walleye. Whoa. Yeah, seven and a half, over seven and a half pounds. It was a beautiful fish. Wow. So that was that's like, a, that's like a newborn baby. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there, there's a picture uh, on the Facebook page of a friend of the podcast, Mike Amaron, who I yep. salmon adventure with holding, yeah. holding the two big walleye and uh, it, they're pretty impressive looking fish. So yeah, that we guy, had a great time. That guy catches big fish too. I got to come out with you. You do. Absolutely. We need to fix that. We got we to gotta figure something out here. So let's talk about what we were doing. So yeah. I would say I caught the most fish out of anybody on the trip. I was using primarily two different uh, presentations and both of those presentations we're also going to talk about again later in the podcast for the bass opener because I use both of them for that but uh, the first one was called a drop shot rig I'm okay explain that in a little bit I was using a three inch Berkeley Maxent flat nose minnow that's what most of that's what the big walleye came off of and the other bait that was doing really well was what's called a swim bait. So it's a four inch soft plastic bait on a jig head. Uh, that Those two baits are kind of, I use this swim bait as what I call a search bait, meaning I'm casting it out and reeling it in and I'm trying to cover water to find fish. So with my search bait, you could use a swim bait. Lots of people use a spinner bait. Lots of people use 
you know, like a lucky bug F-bomb lure, which is a minnow imitation lures that are designed to cast out and reel in fairly quickly looking for fish. Once I find fish with that search bait, uh, I catch as many as I can on the search bait. When the bite slows down, I switch over to the drop shot rig, which is really designed to be fished either vertically or close to bottom very slowly. Most of the time, the fish that we're fishing for, other than muskie and pike, you know, bass, walleye, and kind of the popular game fish in Southern Ontario are schooling fish. So what happens is you catch one or two out of a pod of fish that are the really aggressive fish. If you kept using the same lure that was moving quickly, only the aggressive ones will hit it. But then usually if you slow down and throw back with another bait, you can pick up two, three, four more fish out of that same pod of fish that you've found by slowing down and switching up the presentation a little bit. Interesting. Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to come back to both of those presentations in a second. And then the uh, other one I wanted to talk about was I had a week off between the French River, went up to the family cottage, spent most of the weekend just hanging out with the family, <laughs> but my wife gave me an hour and a half it's on a good Saturday <laughs> and yep. said, oh, you got an hour and a half, go. So I went out. <laughs> Look, looking for walleye with that same drop shot rig and uh, found one of my spots that I normally catch walleye on, dropped that drop shot rig down, felt a, a really light little hit and set the hook. And anglers who do a lot of angling will tell you often with a really big fish, you can tell it's a really big fish right away. This pike that I caught was definitely one of those fish. So I felt a tap, set the hook, and I thought for a second that I was snagged. And then the fish, I don't right. even think it knew it was hooked because the first couple of head shakes were just small little head shakes. And then once it realized that it was hooked, it took off and took quite a bit of line and the fight was on. And I, I managed to boat my new personal best pike it was uh, nice. Yeah, it was a huge fish, 42 and a half inches from the nose to the fork of the tail <laughs> and uh, a 16 inch girth. And it was just a giant. I've got a, a video. I was by myself in the boat. So the picture of it is not that great. But I took a video of the fish in my live well and the fish is the full length of the live well. And wow, what a fish. I was shaking. I was so excited. It was amazing. My goodness. Now I got to ask, have you been catching uh, bigger fish since you became the host of a hunting and fishing podcast? <laughs> I think I have, as a matter of fact. It's been, yeah, I think you, know, you have too. Other than the muskie, which is 11 straight days of muskie fishing with no fish, everything else so far has been panning out quite well, fortunately for me. So, Well, your muskie hunting is like my turkey hunting then. <laughs> Again, process, not payoff. Well, yeah, that, that big pike was a, a really nice one. Again, the video is up on the YouTube channel, Facebook page, if you wanted to see the picture and a little bit of a report. And uh, yeah, that one again was caught on that same Berkeley Mac scent flat nose minnow on a drop shot rig. Amazing. Amazing. All right. So bass opener, once, once bass opens, then what? everything's everything's open right that's it as of this coming saturday the fourth saturday in june and actually bass is already open in some areas in the province okay. in the southern parts but this last saturday in june it opens up everywhere else quickly before we get into that though I, we need to do a reminder we have yes. been talking almost exclusively about fishing over the last yes. few podcasts and before i get into the bass opener i wanted to remind everybody anybody who's a deer hunter the time is now to apply for your antlerless tag. Uh, and so if you're a new hunter, the way it works is you can buy a deer tag for anywhere in Southern Ontario. It will only allow you to hunt for deer with antlers. So if your intention is to either hunt in a controlled hunt, which in Southern Ontario would mean either being able to use a shotgun or a rifle, other, you know, uh, 
a tool other than a bow to be able to harvest a deer. You need to apply for those tags now. The other one is the antlerless tag where I know I'm going to be hunting in the same spot I did last year, that wildlife management unit. I need to apply for an antlerless tag. If I get drawn for that, that means I will be able to take any deer that I see. Otherwise, I will only be stuck with just being able to shoot a buck. Right. Okay. So don't forget, end of the month, that antlerless tag is due. So the time is now. And a great reminder because my head hasn't necessarily been in the hunting space lately. That's right. I mean, we've been talking a lot about fishing. We're just getting into summertime now, doing a lot of stuff outside with the kids. So yeah, good reminder. Thank you for that. You bet. All right. So bass opener. Um, again, one of my favorite times of the year. Once this weekend rolls around, I'll be able to fish anywhere for anything that I normally fish for, which is great to have those options. I've been catching lots of bass out of season trying to find the walleye and pike. So uh, that's exciting. I'm going to quickly talk about kind of three different methods that I would use in order to fish for bass on the opener. And generally the way I do it is I have one rod dedicated to each of these three methods in my boat so that I don't okay. have to stop and retie every time I want to do something. Oh, good. Okay. So, and just like golfing, you can think of fishing kind of like owning a set of golf clubs. I have yeah. different rods for different applications. And so I would have a different rod for each of these three, but these are probably the three most popular methods for catching bass. The first one is what I already referred to, which is a swim bait. So this would be a search bait. You could use that Lucky Bug F-bomb. You could use a Rapala Shad Wrap. You know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of lures that perform kind of the same feature. What I've been using for the last year or so that's really producing well for me is a soft plastic bait by a company called Kitech. Okay. K-E-I-T-E-C-H, Kitech swing impact the three and a half four inch and four and a half inch sizes are amazing baits those are put onto a lunker hunt darter jig head okay so that's kind of like a bullet shaped weight at the front with a hook on it and then i use the soft plastic and thread that soft plastic onto the jig really easy to use which is one of the reasons that i highly recommend it even for beginners it's one of those baits where you just throw it out and reel it in what i try to do with it is cast it out and the first cast i'll count it down while it's sinking for three seconds and start reeling okay. if i don't hit bottom or hit a fish on my next cast i'll count for four seconds and so forth on every cast, I'll let it sink another second until I start ticking bottom or I hit a fish. Okay. Then it's repeatable. You know, in an area, most areas you're fishing won't have huge variability. You know, I'm anchored on a spot and I'm casting from there. Then I'll know, okay, in this spot, I need to let it sink five seconds before I start reeling it in. Okay. The, if you're looking for Kitech, they're a Japanese bait that's been brought into Canada over the last couple of years. Check out theammosource.com because they have one of the widest ranges of Kitech baits in all of Ontario, maybe all of Canada. And they carry all of the baits that I'm about to talk about. So the F-bomb, that Kitech bait, those darter jig heads, all of those things are available at theammosource.com. Okay. So nice. that's what I'm going to start my day with. I'm going to start pitching that. Hopefully that'll produce fish. My backup to that will be one of two things. The next one is a drop shot rig. Okay. I discovered drop shotting maybe three years ago. And I would say that I've never found a technique that has produced more fish for me than drop shotting. Really? And it's amazing because you can use it in so many different ways. And it's very different from the way most anglers set up. So most anglers, what they do is they tie their hook to the end of the line, and then they have weights further up the line. So the hook is on the bottom, and then the weight is up from that. Yep. A drop shot rig works in the opposite direction. 
So you tie on the hook and then it's got either a long dropper from your knot or there's another hook or line tie on the bottom of the hook where you put in a 12 to 18 inch piece of line and the weight is on the bottom. Huh. Okay, so the reason it works well is that it allows me to place a bait a specific distance from the bottom and still be close to bottom. And that length of the dropper, I determine based on what I'm seeing on my fish finder on the boat. So if you're noticing that fish are right belly to bottom and turned off, drop shot maybe not is, is maybe not the choice for you. Maybe you're going to want to go with a jig or something that sits right on bottom. Typically, fish are not belly to bottom. They're, you know, kind of close to bottom, but not right on it. If that's what you're finding, you can fine tune where your bait is sitting so that the bait is just above where the fish are sitting. Okay. The other part I like about it is that when I'm using a soft plastic bait, like those flat nose minnows or an X zone uh, slammer, or there's lots of other baits that you could use in that, in that application, it looks unbelievably realistic under the water. A little twitch will make the minnow kind of come up and shimmy and you wouldn't believe how good it looks. And I'm gonna do a video on the YouTube channel to show how to set up a drop shot rig and what it looks like underwater. Cool, yeah. So the three, the three pieces you need are a drop shot weight, a drop shot hook, and the ones I use are called VMC spin shot hooks, but lots of other manufacturers make them other than VMC, and then some sort of soft plastic bait. But again, the one I really like is those Berkeley Max Scent flat nose minnows or the flatworm. Okay, so that's a drop shot bait. And then the last one that I would use is what's called a Senko or a stick bait. So these baits kind okay. of came onto the bass market maybe 10 years ago by a company called Yamamoto and they make a five inch and a six inch Senko. It looks just like a soft plastic stick. They make them in dozens and dozens of different colors. The way you rig it is just hook it through the middle of the, of the worm. They call it wacky style. So you just basically wanna have the bait sit horizontal on the hook when it's in the water. And as it's falling, it kind of flaps on its way down. So that it kind of parachutes down and the two ends are flapping. Okay. And it's just a dynamite bass lure. You know, you flip that into any cover, weeds, anything like that, it produces a ton of fish. So that's another great option. If you, you know, all three of those have the benefit of being really simple to tie, really simple to fish and super effective. So. Those would be my three kind of entry level, but even for advanced anglers, if you've been fishing for a long time and you haven't tried these techniques, you need yeah. to give them a go because they yeah. really produce. Right on. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think our uh, listeners would certainly benefit from seeing some videos about how to rig that up. And um, it's kind of new to me, certainly. And uh, yeah, I love these tips, man. You got to check out uh, all of Brian's real quick tips on the website at castandblast.com. Thanks for those, Brian. You bet. And I think that's all that I had to talk about today. Uh, hopefully on our next podcast, I'll have a, some big bass to tell you about. Yeah. And we might yeah. even switch over from uh, rods to guns on the yeah, next you got it. That's what I was just going to say. So we've been kind of neglecting the shooting side of the business uh, and the shooting side of the podcast now that all the seasons are going to be open after this podcast uh, i think one of the things we should probably talk about is sighting in a gun and getting to the range because the summertime is a great way to make sure you're ready for those fall hunting seasons get in some practice behind your guns so that you know where your rifles are landing i'm going to try to get to the skeet and trap range so that my shooting is better for when when we go duck hunting in the fall so yep you know, working on all of those skills over the summer is A, enjoyable, and B, yeah. going to put you way oh. farther ahead in the fall. I'm so excited. I had a great Father's Day. Me and the boys killed, killed a lot of pop cans over the weekend. So Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So looking forward to that episode for sure. Good stuff. 
Right thank on, you. Bri. Well, thanks, man. And thank you for uh, for listening in on episode five. Holy smokes, can't believe we're at episode five. So thanks again for our, to our sponsors, uh, theamosource.com, Lucky Bug Lures, and apparelco.ca. Awesome. We really appreciate everybody's support. And like Roger just said, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. This has been Canada's Cast and Blast podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. And if that happens to be on YouTube, hit the notification button so you'll be told every time we post something new. All of the episodes are available at castandblastcanada.com. Mm-hmm.